Okay, let's take a look at uh, the Musket and Pike games. I just um, acquired most of these in the past couple of weeks. Uh, finally decided to, you know, I'd sort of been on the fence. Uh, do I want to hunt them down? They're kind of expensive. They're all out of print, uh, except the most recent one, Saints in Armor. Um, you know, did I want to chase them down and pay the prices for them? Um, you know, I've, I've hunted down a lot of older out-of-print games that I'd considered grail games that I wanted to have on my shelf and wanted to experience playing. And uh, Musket and Pike was one of those, well, I'll get around to it kind of things. Um, the problem is, is that there's six of those games now, I think, and uh, uh, as you can see, I only have five of them. Um, but they're not getting reprinted anytime soon. Um, one of the reasons I only have five is the first one called This Accursed Civil War, which is about the English Civil War. Um, is on the reprint, the P500 reprint list for GMT. Uh, GMT takes their sweet time doing reprints um, for anything that's not a big seller or one of their core kind of gaming brands. Um, so, you know, currently the coin series of games, um, which are down there, you can see the uh, Cuba Libre. Distant Plane, and uh, the uh, Fire in the Lake. Um, I don't have Andy and Abyss, which is the first one. The topic just didn't really interest me that much. Um, all of those are, you know, fast track reprints. Uh, Distant Plane and Cuba Libre are, just came out last year, and they're already out of print, and will be getting reprinted um, sometime, I think, in the first or second quarter next year, which is pretty quick for GMT. Uh, Twilight Struggle is another example of a game that they reprint. Um, you know, even before it goes out of stock, they're already ordering more to reprint it. That's just, it's one of their core cornerstone titles. Same thing up there, the Combat Commander games, those get pretty frequent, regular reprints. As do, all the way up there at the top of the shelf, something like Commands and Colors, Ancients, or Napoleonics down there. Uh, th those are all big sellers for them um, and will get reprinted regardless of how many people have ordered reprint copies on the P500 list. Whereas something like Musket and Pike, which they don't, uh, you know, don't sell a whole lot. I mean, nothing gained but glory. Well, they do sell out, but nothing gained but glory, for example, was, was chucked into the bargain bin. Um, and that was printed what, 2010 maybe? Yeah, 2010. That was in the bargain bin. Finally just sold out in the fall sale uh, last year, in 2013. So, you know, it takes a couple of years for these Musket and Pike games to sell out. Um, but sell out they do. Uh, nothing Game of Glory did sell out, and I imagine Saints and Armor will probably also sell out. Um, part of the problem with Nothing Game of Glory is that it covered the Scanian War, which, you know, I certainly never heard of, and I'm a pretty big military history buff, so um, pretty tailored specific uh, um, battles that are uh, being chosen for some of these games and uh, not a lot of people know about them so they might not might not sell as many copies. Um, Saints and Armor, the newer one, covers some more well-known battles um, of the Thirty Years War so I think that one will probably sell out faster. Uh, the, the the first one, the this Accursed Civil War, like I said, is on P, GMT's P500 reprint list. I did not um, search it out. Uh, I could have found it probably for a similar price to what I found Gustav Adolf the Great and uh, Sweet Fights on for, um, probably in that sixty to eighty dollar range. Um, but it's it's got three hundred and ninety so orders, I think, on on GMT's P five hundred reprint list. Um, I've got a copy of it, the reprint copy pre ordered with them. Uh, I think based on their schedule that they've got of reprinting all of their core games like uh, the coin games and commands and colors, um, as well as all of their core CDG games like uh, Paths of Glory and uh, For the People, uh, Wilderness War, and so forth. Um, they're going to get all these reprints out of the way, a big aggressive reprint schedule of their Cornerstone stuff uh, done this year, which will finally free up their reprint list for some of the neglected things. There's some great Battles of History titles on there. There's some uh, uh, World War II titles, their Army Group titles on Barbarossa or whatever. 
um, that have been languishing out on the reprint list for quite a few years, um, and hopefully they'll get to this accursed Civil War. It's got more orders than just about anything else on the reprint list, so um, I, I suspect they may get to it in 2016 or so. Next year will be a little little crammed full of, of other reprints uh, for GMT's production capacity to quite handle. So I'm guessing if they get if they get to it um, and don't actually wait for it to reach 500 and just say, hey, we're going to reprint this. It'll be close to 500 by 2016 anyway, if not over. Um, <coughs> then I think we'll see finally see a long-awaited reprint. Um, of that game, so I decided just to wait. Uh, you know, I'm content. This is the five games that I have here, none of which I've played yet. Uh, will be plenty of gaming um, just by itself, in addition to all the other crap that I have on my shelves that I haven't gotten around to playing yet. That's what happens when you uh, get back into the hobby of wargaming quickly and uh, want to establish um, a, a sizable collection in a fairly short period of time. You end up with a lot of things that you haven't played. Although I've played, uh, I mean, I'm pretty proud of what I've played uh, that's on my shelves so far, um, but there is my to-be-played, my unplayed stack is still fairly, fairly large. Um, so, and I just made it a lot larger by getting these games. Um, I wanted to go over them because I've actually, uh, Under the Lily Banners was the only one that I had prior to this point. This is actually the third title in the series, um, which covers some of the French and Spanish fighting um, in the Musket and Pike series. This one I actually found at a game store on the shelf last year, and it came out in 2005. I uh, found it on the shelf at a game store last year for MSRP, so I picked it up because I thought, hey, it's out of print. i get a copy of it for 60 bucks. That's about what you find it for auction or eBay or... You know, you might, it might even cost more than that in some cases, so why not pick up a shrink, shrink-wrapped shrink copy? So this is the only one that I've actually punched and clipped all the counters for. So I won't go through, I won't open this one, I just set it out there to, uh, to show the scale of the collection. Uh, all, the, all the other ones, though, I just got recently enough that I haven't actually punched them out. And three of them, uh, Gustav Adolf, Saints in Armor, and Nothing Gained But Glory, were all shrink-wrapped uh, when I got them, which is pretty nice. Uh, Saints and Armor I got in the fall sale um, just uh, two weeks ago, and Nothing Gained But Glory, I found a shrink-wrapped copy on a BGG uh, auction um, for fairly cheap, 35 bucks. Gustav Adolf the Great, I found an uh, eBay auction for 60 bucks, found that shrink-wrapped. Um, Sweet and Fights On, a little more expensive, I found that on uh, uh, Consum World, I sent out a looking for email or a posting on the Consum World Marketplace, and a slew of wargamers were quick to reply um, and hook me up with the copy. But that was not shrink wrap, that was used. Um, so I thought, hey, well, you know, I don't know if anybody's done unboxing videos of these uh, of these older Musket and Pike games. I know people did it for Saints and Armor, so I'll skip the Saints and Armor uh, unboxing. Although, the cool thing about this is that these, this series has spanned from 2001 to present. Um, and it does a pretty cool job of showing you Roger McGowan's uh, evolving art style um, just in the past 15 years. Uh, you know, he's been around since the uh, 70s, early 80s, doing, um, you know, some of the famous Avalon Hill covers and things like that. Um, he is the in-house artist um, uh, for GMT, and probably the only in-house artist that any of these, uh, and by in-house, I mean, he doesn't actually work at the warehouse at GMT, but he is their guy on staff who does exclusive, covers exclusively for GMT and does their C3i magazine. Um, probably the only publisher that actually has an artist that's on staff, otherwise they contract all this stuff out. They may contract it out to McGowan too, for all I know, but all I know is that he does exclusively uh, GMT stuff. So, um, But th these the covers of these are a great example of his changing artistic style over the past uh, 15 years. The oldest one, Sweden Fights On, is the second title. Um, so here, and maybe I'll move this so I can get a better look straight down instead of trying to hold it up in front of the camera. Um, 
here you've got what I call his um, classic sort of clip art phase where he would take these images like this guy or this guy and then you know you can see this, this stuff in the background um, little things here like the the helmet and, and coat of arms and stuff and he would take it from these these images from disparate sources and sort of stick them on in a composed you know with a composition um, cover you know here he's put a, kind of put the map in the center of where all these battles are taking place then lists out the battles um, puts the game designers name on there this is from 2003 uh, the next one in the series was under the lily banners which is very similar um, you've got you know it, Images probably sourced from different areas. This one he reuses, and he reuses a lot of his images. Um, again, listing out the battles there. No map this time on this one. Um, you've just got characters from the particular battles or the era that these particular battles were fought. Uh, again, with this sort of grayed out, um, you know, lithograph style stuff uh, in the background um, that he used similarly on the Sweden fights on. In the, kind of in the background there. So these two fairly similar um, repetitive themes here. You've got the swords in the background behind the battle. Same way you've got the swords kind of in the background behind the battles there. Um, by the time the fourth one comes around, which is Gustav Adolf the Great, first of all you've got a different color. Um, the two box, other two boxes kind of had tan coloring. This one's all blue. Um, now you're getting to kind of a single image on the cover. You don't have this collection of images from different um, periods. You've just got Gustav Adolf himself there in a, you know, an old print from some kind of source that he's pulled this from. Um, still got some of those elements of kind of the grayed out background stuff, uh, but otherwise it's just a natural background and a single image of Gustav Adolf with the battles arrayed around it and shields and kind of a picture frame around it. Um, so sort of a theme of, of uh, since the game is Gustav Adolf the Great, the theme of the cover here is a picture sort of honoring Gustav Adolf. Um, you know, with the interesting script um, there that he's, and he's done different scripting for all the titles on all of these. Uh, and that's by 2006, so that's a three-year period there, um, where he's kind of moved from the assembly of images to the single image um, on the cover. And now here, with Nothing Game at Glory, um, you can see he kind of continues with that, just going with a single image piece of artwork. Um, not the greatest quality of the image here on the cover, and I don't know if that's the best quality of the image that you can find. Probably not a lot of, not a substantial body of artwork on the Scanian War. Um, so, you know, you work with what you have, I guess. But you can see he's also moved back to doing sort of the coat of arms and the musket and pike, because um, it is the musket and pike series, so uh, why not? Um, and you can see here where the game design here is actually no longer um, Ben Hall, who was the original designer of the series. Um, these, this one, uh, we had some different guys doing this um, than, than Ben Hall, who has now let other developers come in, other designers come in and take a crack at his system. Um, it's got seven battles in it, though, which is, is pretty good um, you know, compared to Sweden Fights On, which I think has only four battles. So... Uh, Nice collection of battles here, nothing going to gain but glory. Um, but again, we're back to the tan colored box here. Um, but with this, with just a single image, um, just a little reference to the coat of arms and the clash, cross swords again, and then, you know, again, a sort of a seal here of, I don't know, Sweden or somebody. Um, so, kind of a return to form there, but sticking with the single image of main artwork instead of the sort of assembly clip art stuff. Now, that's 2010. By 2012, for Saints and Armor, this is where Roger McGowan has now moved to doing um, just, in most cases, just a single piece of period artwork. Or, if not artwork from the actual period, then a single piece of artwork depicting a scene from the actual period. 
um, and usually an oil painting of some kind. And so his his uh, games in general over the past three years, two or three years, have started to take this route where he we no longer see this assembly of disparate sourced images that we get on the covers of Sweden Fights On, and the Lily Banners. We've now moved to these single pieces of artwork in which he composes, um, you know, you still have an elaborate scripted title, but he'll compose the design around a central piece of artwork. Um, and you'll see that on any of the newer games uh, that he's done. Um, Dark Valley goes that route. Um, no Retreat goes that route. Uh, definitely the 1914 games and uh, Ted Racer's 1914 Glory's End and Dual Pack. All those came out within the past several years. Uh, 19, well, Twilight in the East um, is a little older format. Um, Offensive Outrance is definitely part of his newer sort of single piece of artwork. Um, other titles that he's doing single pieces of artwork on, I guess Crown of Roses, there, that's one. Uh, Blood and Roses definitely um, followed this, the single piece of artwork. Um, Unhappy King Charles, I know, did the same kind of thing. Um, then down at the bottom there, uh, uh, Serpents of the Seas, single piece of artwork. Iron and Oak, single piece of artwork. So, uh, and you know, there's lots of other um, GMT releases recently. Those are just the ones I'm pointing out that I actually own. Uh, but he's certainly done it um, with a lot of their releases in the past couple of years. So just one of those things I find interesting um, to see how somebody who's been in the business that long to see how his own style uh, evolves over time. So let's take a look at uh, Sweden Fights On. This one uh, described by Callendale is is probably the best in the series as far as he's concerned, although I don't think he's played Gustav, or no, I don't think he's played Under the Lily Banners yet, so his opinion may be subject to revision. Um, bags and dice. Dice usually get chucked into a mug, coffee mug for me. Now here's the series rules, and these have definitely changed, um, been updated. Saints and Armor, I believe, has the latest version of these series rules, which is version 6. Um, so this now is just kind of a quaint antique um, of an earlier era of the Musket and Pike series to be looked at only as a curiosity. Uh, the playbook, playbook for these are generally very good. Um, I like the artwork on the cover of that one. Uh, lots of good historical notes um, that Ben Hall usually puts in here. Some designer notes, uh, although it looks like just one page of designer notes there. Um, scans of the counter sheets, but, but these little tactics section sections he puts in there. I've been reading it on uh, reading the tactics section for Under the Lily Banners too. I don't know if there's one for Gustav Adolf the Great, uh, but I guess we'll find out. But it's really nice to see tactics. Um, you know, for these era of for this era of games where you know people aren't, especially Americans, aren't familiar with this style of fighting from this era um, that a lot of these battles were fought. Putting something in, you know, it's one thing to learn the rules of how the game works. It's quite another to learn, well, you know, I know how everything works mechanically on the board now, but, uh, you know, how the hell do these different units interact with each other? What's the, what should I attack with what? Um, how should I use my my uh, cavalry? How should I use these pike formations? That you, who knows? You know, I don't know. I don't know enough about this period to, to instinctively know how I should move these guys around the battlefield. So it's great to have tactics articles um, in more esoteric or obscure uh, period games like this. And then, yeah, here, he, there are notes in here um, about the, how the armies were organized, uh, their arms and equipment, um, yeah, historical notes. So really good historical notes in this stuff. I'm reading the Lily Banners ones right now. Um, it, I assume all these have these kinds of historical notes in them um, to look at. So otherwise, it's, you know, your setup information, your battle information, uh, all the typical stuff you see in a playbook. Very nice. And the maps, um, I think there's two map sheets, each back printed um, for each of the battles. In fact, four, ba yeah, four battles, so each of these will be 
will be back printed. Um, and the artwork has remained consistently good on these maps. Um, are these Simonich maps? Yes, they are. Um, Simonich always does consistently good quality on his maps. You can always tell a Simonich map by the trees. Um, his trees look like that. On the, I think he does it for the uh, Great Battles of the American Civil War, too. Uh, very similar. Um, so, you know, good GMT quality here. Um, even back, this was in the earlier earlier era of GMT, just in the early aughts. Um, good heavy thick stock. And here you can tell sort of a winter battle here. It's got a blue, blue border on it with the paler ground, whereas you flip over to Whitstock here and uh, you get a tan border with a little greener, a little greener background. Just to the fog. Fortunately, I don't quite have the range on my camera here to show the maps totally unfolded um, or in their totality. I guess I can do it. Pick up the tripod here and pull it back a little bit. Um, so here we can see the Nordlingen map and with kind of a huge uh, huge piece of artwork on there because it's a little smaller space. And this is one where the, the map is vertical as opposed to horizontal. Um, so there's some more charts and tables on this one than on some of the other ones. Which is kind of cool. But again, very good solid map artwork. And there's the the last one. With similar very kind of kind of bare for some of these maps. Usually there's a lot of trees in some of the fighting in Sweden. And although only one player aid card, I looked on the back and sure enough, that's correct. This is it. So uh, you know, scan copies for your friends, I guess, because otherwise you're going to be passing it back and forth between the two of you. Uh, so the earlier era of GMT, maybe they skimped a little on some of the extra components. Here's your counter sheets. Uh, the counters for Musket and Pike have remained largely unchanged. Um, Simonich does these too, and he has a t typical, again, I think also for Great Battles of the American Civil War, so they look kind of similar there, and using the colored bands and so forth to identify your different areas. Um, but I do like the the unit artwork. Um, it's very nice on these. So typical good quality stuff, and then lots of markers with your salvos, open orders, charges, etc. Um, strength point losses, so forth. And then last counter sheet here. Does look like. More, not sure which side. I can't even tell which side is which. It's done by symbols here. I think the Swedes were the blue counters, and those would be whoever they were fighting. So there we have Sweden fights on. Not too much in the box. Under Lily Banners is already punched in the clip, but I thought this would be a good opportunity to do Gustav Adolf the Great, which I just shrink ripped today. And I haven't even opened the box yet, so we'll see what's in there. Hopefully everything's there, because I don't know if GMT will be able to replace this stuff. I think they'll keep replacement counter sheets and so forth hanging around. Packed by Denise, and the usual GMT customer service thing. And how many battles are in this one? Is it five battles? Yes. Yeah, so I'm not sure if there's going to be two maps back printed or if on one of these, or three maps with one that's not back printed. This one is not that good, so um, here. Brightonfield, Honeyfield. Ah, so this has two on it. So it's probably one, maybe three on one. Not sure exactly how they'll do it here. Colors are a little different on these, um, but otherwise, still Simonich doing the doing the artwork. Who's nothing if not consistent. Lutzen, Brightonfield. Oh, no, this is cool. So for Lutzen, as you can see here, the city's in flames. <laughs> it's rare that you see them putting that kind of detail on 
the maps. And on the back is my brand felt again. Camp uh, displayed on there. So, again, good quality, quality heavy stock maps. So, none of that change between the printing of Sweden Fights On and Gustav Adolf. This one has a sheet of counters and half sheet here, too. So, two and a half. Sheets basically. Um, sheet two looks like these were laying in marker, and then reverse order. Sheet three down to sheet two, down to sheet one. So it's good to see all the counters are present. Um, in terms of alignment, usually the back is where the alignment problems are, if there's any, and it looks good. Nobody's feet are cut off or numbers cut off. So that's always a good sign. Same goes for counter sheet two. Now here, I printed off a color turn record track with a little dead box and pursuit box. Nice, good, heavy, non-glossy cardstock with the color printout. So um, between Sweden Fights On and Under the Lily Banners on this one, they've definitely upgraded. Again, looks like only one player aid card though, so I guess they spent the money they would have spent on an extra player aid card making a color turn record chart. Now here we're on the up to rulebook version 4.0, a little different cover on it, a little thicker, heavier stock. Um, one thing I did no I have noticed uh, it was the same with uh, the Great Battles of the American Civil War and Red Badge of Courage, which came out in 2001, I think. Um, they had these thinner, thinner quality rule books for a number of years there and it looks like by about 2005 2006 um, they've moved to these heavier stock uh, heavier stock books with the baggies stuck in there yeah, so that's a good heavy heavy stock playbook there for uh, Gustav Adolf the Great and in this one looks like again we have some great uh, historical notes there. Pages dense with text. I love that. Um, talking about some of the key players of the of the era at the time. Um, talking about here some of the army army organization, um, which is really nice to see this level of detail in here. Just quite a few pages at the end of this. Um, and here another another article on tactics. Which is again great, great, great stuff um, to have in these games. So, Gustav Adolf the Great, very handsome looking presentation, as always. And we'll go ahead and take a look at the game, but glory. Slip. And now we're up to version 5.0 on the rulebook. Same illustration on the cover. Though. And in this one, again, marker counter sheet first. And lots of red on this one. It's counter sheet two. Alignment's good. Again, I don't know which side is which in the scanning there. I don't know who fought whom. But we've got red versus blue, whatever that means. Probably broken down by religion, maybe. Because all these guys have Swedish or German looking names, so take that for what you will. And then now oh, these maps are uh, much darker in color. These are sort of like with the green borders. Um, much, much deeper. 
deeper browns and greens here than the typical tan coloring um, that you would see. So, uh, interesting. And I think the same will happen, uh, it'll be the same for Saints and Armor, which has um, much greener, much greener looking maps. And so, there's definitely a change in the maps uh, here. Well, this one certainly is different than anything I've seen in the series up to this point. Uh, there's the siege, basically. This is the assault on Malmo. And I don't know if there's a, a battle that leads up to the assault on Malmo. The, the name's familiar, but anyway, this is a smaller sort of extra map here. But again, lots of browns and greens. Um, and this one looks like, this is Lund, looks like it's winter, because uh, it's got the... Got the blue border with kind of the grayish, wintry-looking terrain. Contrast that with Lenskrona, which is green-bordered with lots of browns and greens, so... I think we're dealing with some different weather types for these. And again here, here's the playbook. Another good thick playbook for nothing being but glory. And let's see, yep, lots of, again, more excellent historical notes um, for all the different battles actually I, don't know, I guess it's more set up you know what not more excellent historical notes those are actually that was actually just more setup stuff I guess because there's seven battles in this one um, there's good notes for each good historical notes for each battle um, but not the sort of tactics breakdown and army uh, composition breakdown that we saw. Oh, I guess I spoke too soon. I was sitting here the whole time. Playbook 2, notes and bonus scenarios. So here, so this time, the historical notes are... get their own entire book. So I stand corrected. The historical notes are very good <laughs> because... They had to offload them to another book. And this is, again, the obscure nature of this particular conflict, uh, the Scanian War. Um, right here, historical narrative of it. So, and this goes on. Lots of good maps. It goes on for quite a few pages. Um, and then a nice bibliography of um, Scanian War sources. So, a little bit on weapons, firearms. Um, designer's notes. So really nice. Again, just another A-plus uh, historical presentation for Musket and Pike. And it looks like here they've got two of these colors, a little thinner and a glossy stock compared to what was in uh, Gustave Adolf the Great. Um, but they've got two of them, so now each side can have a dead box and a uh, pursuit box, so that's good. And finally, two player aid cards. So, um, GMT spending the big production money to get more player aid cards this time and more color player aid cards. So, it's the evolution of the company over time there. By, 2000, by 2010, they were putting a lot more a lot more stuff in the box. So, anyway, that's a look at uh, the Muska and Pike games, the uh, evolution of Roger McGowan's artwork over the course of the series from 2000. Well, we didn't see the cover from 2001 for this accursed civil war, um, but if you've seen that online, I can guarantee you the Accursed Civil War cover looks very much like Sweden Fights On. You've got two images of two guys standing on either side of a map, I think. So, 
Um, so the the look of it there is very much the same. Um, so I look forward to getting to these soon. Um, not sure when that will happen. I've got a lot of punching and clipping to do. The only one that I've punched and clipped is under the lily banners. And I also have um, something else that I had just acquired recently uh, at the same time as the fall sale that's actually based on Musk and Pike. And this is Avec Infini Regret. Um, pardon my butchered French there. Uh, and this is from the publishers of Vivictus, Vivictus magazine. Um, and uh, this actually uses it's the Wars of Religion uh, Volume 1 and it covers a couple different battles here Droz, Contra and La Roche La Belle um, some battles from the 1500s but this actually uses um, a version of the Musket and Pike system uh, sort of a, I've heard it described as mus musket and pipe light. Um, and they, it's not quite as heavy as the musket and pike system, which is a tactical system is fairly heavy, um, especially if you're not um, familiar with that era of combat. Um, and so this Avec Infini Regret uh, is apparently more of a, kind of streamlines things and makes it a little bit easier system uh, to handle little smaller battles, I think, than what the Musket and Pike games give you. So I may actually start with that and then work my way to, to Musket and Pike, um, but we shall see.